This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 1 of Deportation, Its Meaning and Menace Last Message to the People of America by Alexander Berkman and Emma Goldman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 1 Deportation, Its Meaning and Menace The war is over, but peace there is not. On a score of fronts, human slaughter is going on as before. Men, women, and children are dying by the hundred thousands because of the blockade of Russia. The small nations are still under the iron heel of the foreign oppressor. Ireland, India, Egypt, Persia, Korea, and numerous other peoples are being decimated and exploited even more ruthlessly than before the advent of the great prophet of world democracy. Self-determination has become a byword, nay, a crime, and worldwide imperialism has gotten a stranglehold upon humanity. What, then, has the great war accomplished? To what purpose the sacrifice of millions of human lives, the unnameable loss in blood and treasure? What especially has happened in these United States? Fresh in mind are still the wonderful promises made in behalf of the war. It was to be the last war, a holy crusade of liberty against tyranny, a war upon all wars that was to sweep the earth clear of oppression and misery, and make the world safe for true democracy. As with a sacred fire burned the heart of mankind. What soul so small, what human so low, not to be inspired by the glorious shibboleth of liberty and well-being for all? A tornado of social enthusiasm, a newborn world consciousness, swept the United States. The people were aflame with a new faith. They would slay the dragon of despotism and conquer the world for democracy. True, it was but yesterday their sovereign will registered a mighty protest against human slaughter and bloodshed. With a magnificent majority, they had voted not to participate in the foreign war, not to become entangled in the treacherous schemes of European despotisms. Triumphantly, they had elected as President of the United States the man who kept them out of the war, that he might still keep them out of it. Then, suddenly, almost overnight, came the change. From Wall Street sounded the buggle ordering the retreat of humanity. Its echo reverberated in Washington, and thence throughout the whole country. There began a campaign of war publicity that roused the tiger in man and fed his lust for blood and vengeance. The quiet, phlegmatic German was transformed into the vicious Hun, and made the villain of the wildest stories of enemy atrocities and outrages. The nationwide propaganda of hatred, persecution, and intolerance carried its subtle poison into the hearts of the obscurest hamlet, and the minds of the people were systematically confused and perverted by rivers of printer's ink. The conscience of America, wanting peace, was stifled in the folds of the national emblem, and its voice drowned by the martial beat of a thousand war drums. Here and there a note of protest was heard. Radicals of various political and social faiths, anarchists, socialists, IWWs, some pacifists, conscientious objectors, and other anti-militarists, sought to stem the tide of the war hysteria. They pointed out that the people of the United States had no interest in the European war, that this country, because of its geographical location and natural advantages, was beyond all danger of invasion. They showed that the war was the result of European over-preparedness for war. Aggravated by a crisis in capitalist competition, old monarchical rivalries, and ambitions of super-despotic rulers. The peoples of Europe, the radicals emphasized, had neither say nor interest in the war. They were the sheep led to slaughter on the altar of mammon contending against Baal. America's greatest humanitarian mission, the war protestants insisted, was to keep out of the war and use its potent influence and compelling economic and financial power to terminate the European slaughter and bring peace to the bleeding nations of the old world. But these voices of sanity and judgment were lost in the storm of unloosed war passions. The brave men and women that dared to speak in behalf of peace and humanity, that had the surpassing integrity of remaining true to themselves and to their ideals, with the courage of facing danger and death for conscience' sake, these, the truest friends of men, had to bear the cross of Golgotha, as did the Nazarene of yore, as the lovers of humanity have done all through the centuries of human progress. The jail and lynch law for them, 
execution and persecution by their contemporaries. But if it be true that history repeats itself, surely these political criminals of today will be hailed tomorrow as martyrs and pioneers. The popular war hysteria was roused and especially successfully cultivated by the alleged progressive, intellectual element in the United States. Their notoriously overwhelming self-esteem and vanity had been subtly flattered by their fellow intellectual, the college professor become president. This American intelligentsia, inclusive of a good many quite unintelligent suffragettes, was the real balance of power in the re-election of Woodrow Wilson. The silken cord, occasionally golden in spots, of mutual interest that bound the president and the intellectual element, ultimately proved much stronger at their end than at his. The feeling of gratitude is always more potent with the giver than with the recipient. Howbeit the liberals, the radicals, were devoted heart and soul to the professor, they stood solidly behind the president to use their own intellectually expressive phrase. Shame upon the mighty power of the human mind. It was the radical intellectuals who, as a class, turned traitors to the best interests of humanity, perverted their calling and traditions, and became the bloodiest canines of Mars. With a power of sophistry that the Greek masters of false logic never matched, they cited history, philosophy, science, Aye, they called their very Christ to witness that the killing of man by man is a most worthy and respectable occupation, indeed a very Christian institution. And that wholesale human slaughter, if properly directed and successfully conducted, is a very necessary evolutionary factor, a great blessing in disguise. It was this intellectual element that by perversion of the human mind turned the peace-demanding people into a war-mad mob, the popular refusal to volunteer for service was hailed by them as a universal demand for military draft as the most democratic expression of a free citizenship. Forced service became, in their interpretation, equality of contribution for rich and poor alike. The protest of one's conscience against killing was branded by them as high treason, and even mere disagreement regarding the causes of the war or the slightest criticism of the administration was condemned as disloyalty and pro-Germanism. Every expression of humanity, of social sympathy and understanding, was cried down with a babel of high phrases, in which patriotism and democracy competed in volume. Oh, the tragedy of the human mind that absorbs fine words and empty phrases and is deaf to motives and blind to deeds! Yet there lacked unanimity in the strenuously cultivated war demand. There was no popular enthusiasm for American participation in the European Holocaust. Mothers protested against their children being torn from the home hearth. Fathers hid their young sons. The spirit of discontent was abroad. The government had to resort to drastic methods. The hand of white terror was lifted in Washington. Again, we raised our voices to warn the people. We, the revolutionists of various social views who remain true to our ideal of human brotherhood and proletarian solidarity, we pointed out that the masses of the world had nothing to gain and everything to lose by war, that the chief sufferers of every war were the workers, and that they were being used as mere pawns in the game of international diplomacy and imperialist capitalism. We reminded the toilers that they alone possessed the power to wage war or make peace, and that they, as the creators of the world's wealth, were the true arbiters of the fate of humanity. Their mission, we reiterated, is to secure peace on earth and the product of labor to the producers. Emphatically, we warned the people of America against the policy of suppression by the enactment of special legislation. Alleged war necessity was being used, we asserted, to incorporate in the statute books new laws and new legal principles that would remain operative after the war and be effective for the continued prohibition of governmentally unapproved thoughts and views. The practice of stifling and choking free speech and press established and tolerated during the war sets a most dangerous precedent for after-war days. The principle of such outrages upon liberty once introduced it will require a long and arduous struggle to win back the liberties lost. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Thus we argued. Here again the intellectuals and radicals of chameleon hue hastened to the rescue of the forces of reaction. We were scoffed at, our vain fears ridiculed. It was all for the best interests of the country, the sophists protested. 
for the greater security and glory of democracy. Now reaction is in full swing. The actual reality is even darker than our worst predictions. Liberty is dead, and white terror on top dominates the country. Free speech is a thing of the past. Not a city in the whole wide land but that forbids the least expression of an unpopular opinion. It is descriptive of the whole situation that after thirty years' activity in New York, we are unable, upon our return from prison, to secure any whole, large or small, to lecture even on the subject of prison life or to speak on the question of amnesty for political and industrial prisoners. The doors of every meeting place are closed to us, as well as to other revolutionists, by order of the powers that be. Free press has been abolished, and every radical paper that dares speak out is summarily suppressed. Raids of public gatherings, of offices and private dwelling places, accomplished with utmost brutality and uncalled for violence, are of daily occurrence throughout the United States. The headquarters of anarchists, of socialists, of IWWs, of the Union of Russian Workers, and numerous other progressive and educational organizations, have been raided by the local police and federal agents in practically every city of this country. Men and women are beaten up indiscriminately, fearfully clubbed and blackjacked without any provocation, frequently to be released afterwards, because no offense whatever could be charged against them. Books and whole libraries of radical centers are confiscated, even textbooks of arithmetic or geography torn to shreds, furniture destroyed, pianos and victrolas smashed to kindling wood, all in the name of the new democracy and for the safety of the glorious free republic of these United States. The half-baked radicals, their hearts as soft as their heads, now stand aghast at this terrible sight. They had helped to win the war. Some had sacrificed fathers, brothers, husbands. All of them had suffered an agony of misery and tears to help the cause of humanity to make the world safe for democracy. Is this what we fought and bled for? They are asking. Have we been misled by the fine-sounding phrases of a professor? And have we in turn helped to delude the people, the suffering masses of the world? Is the great profit of the new democracy strong only in rhetoric? Pity the mind that awaits miracles and looks expectantly to a universal savior. The clear-sighted man, well-informed, may reasonably foresee the inevitability of certain results from given causes. But only a charlatan can play the great savior, and only the fool has faith in him. Individuals, however great, may profoundly influence but are powerless to control the fate of mankind. Deep sociopolitical causes produced the war. The Kaiser did not create it, though the spirit of Prussianism no doubt accelerated its coming. Nor is President Wilson responsible for the present bloody peace. He did not make the war. He was made by it. He did not make the peace. He was unmade by it. The social and economic forces that control the world are stronger than any man, than any set of men. These forces are inherent in the fundamental institutions of our wage-slave civilization, in the social atmosphere created by it, and in the individual mind. These forces are by no means harmonious. The human heart and mind internally reaching out for greater joy and beauty, the spirit of idealism in short, is constantly at strife with the established, the institutionalized. These contending social and human factors produce war as they produce revolution. The powers that succeeded in turning the instinctive current of man's idealism into the channels of war became the masters of human destiny for the nuns. By a campaign of publicity and advertising on a scale history had never witnessed before, by chicanery and lying, by exaggeration and misrepresentation, by persistent and long-continued appeals to the basest as well as to the noblest traits of man, by every imaginable and unprecedented manner and method, the great financial interests, eager for war and aided by the international Junkers, thrust humanity into the great world war. Whatever of noble impulse and unsophisticated patriotism there was in the hearts of the masses, in and out of uniform, was soon almost totally drained in the fearsome rivers of human blood, in the brutal, filthy, degrading charnel house of elemental passions set on fire. But the tiger in man, once thoroughly awakened, grew strong and more vicious with the sights he witnessed and the food he was fed on. The basest propensities unchained, 
the anti-social tendencies engendered and encouraged by the war and the war propaganda are now let loose upon the country. Hatred, intolerance, persecution and suppression. The efficient educational factors in the preparedness and war campaign are now permeating the very heart of this country and propagating its virulent poison into every phase of our social life. But there is no more Hun to be hated and lynched. Commerce and business know their interests. We must feed Germany at a good profit. We must do business with its people. Exit the Hun. Der Moor hat seine Schuldigkeit getan. With a significant sidelight on the artificiality and life brevity of national and racial antagonisms, when the fires of mutual distrust and hatred are not fed by the interested stokers of business and religion. But the Frankenstein and intolerance and suppression cultivated by the war campaign is there, alive and vital, and must find some vent for his accumulated bitterness and misery. Oh there, the radical, the Bolshevik! What better prey to be cast to the Frankenstein monster? The powers that be, the plutocratic imperialist and the jingo prophet here, all heave a happy sigh of relief. The after-war conditions in the United States are filling the government and the more intelligent, class-conscious capitalists with trepidation. Revolution is stalking across Europe. Its specter is threatening America. Disquieting signs multiply daily. A new discontent, boding ill and full of terrible possibilities, is manifest in every walk of life. The war has satisfied no one. Only too obviously the glorious promises failed of fulfillment. Accepting the great financial interests and some smaller war profiteers, the American people at large are aching with a poignant disappointment. Some vaguely, other more consciously and clearly, but almost all feel themselves in some way victimized. They had brought supreme sacrifices, suffered untold misery and pain, in the confident hope of a great change to come into their lives after the victorious war, in the insurance of a radically changed and bettered world. The people feel cheated. Not yet have they been able to fix their gaze definitely upon the specific source of their disappointments, to define the true causes of their discontent. But their impatience with the existing conditions is passionate and bitter, and their former faith in the established order profoundly shaken. Significant symptoms of a social breakdown. Revolutions begin in the heart and in the mind, Action follows in due course. Political and industrial institutions, bereft of the people's faith in them, are doomed. The changed attitude toward the once honored and sacred conditions, now evident throughout the land, symbolizes the complete bankruptcy of the existing order. The old conceptions and ideas underlying present-day society are fast disintegrating. New ideals are germinating in the hearts of the masses. A prolific soil rich with the promise of a brighter future. America is on the threshold of the social revolution. All this is well realized by the financial and political masters of this country. The situation is profoundly disquieting, but most terrifying to them is the new attitude of labor. It is unprecedented, intolerable in its complete disregard of long-accepted standards and conditions. Its open rebellion against things as they are, its shameless demands, its defiance of constituted authority. Is it possible, the masters wonder, that we had gone too far in our wartime promises of democracy and freedom, of justice to the workers, of well-being for all? Too reckless was our motto. Labor will win the war. It has given the toilers a sense of their power. It has made them arrogant, aye, menacing. No more are they satisfied with a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. No, not even with wages doubled and trebled. They are laying sacrilegious hands upon the most sacrosanct institution of private ownership. They challenge the exclusive mastery of the owner in his own mine and mill. They demand actual participation in industry, even in the most secret councils that control production and manipulate distribution. Aye, they even dare suggest the taking over by labor of all industry. Unheard of impudence. Yet this is not all. More menacing still is the revolutionary spirit that is beginning to transfuse itself through every rank of labor, from the highest paid to the lowest, organized and the unorganized as well. Disobedience is rampant. 
Gone is the good old respect for orders, the will of superiors is secretly thwarted or openly defied, the mystic power of contracts has lost its old hold. Labor is in rebellion, in rebellion against state and capital, aye, even against their own leaders that have so long held them in check. No time is to be lost. Quick, drastic action is necessary. Else the brewing storm will overwhelm us, and the workers deprive us of the wealth that we have been at such pains to accumulate. Even now there are such terribly disquieting rumblings, as if the very earth were shaking beneath our feet. Rumors of the dictatorship of the proletariat, of Soviets of workers, soldiers, and sailors. Horrible thought! Why, if the soldiers should join these discontented workers, what would become of us poor capitalists? Indeed, have not the police of Boston already set the precedent, made common cause with labor these traitors to their masters? Soviet of workers, dictatorship of the proletariat. Why, that's the Russian idea, the terrible Bolshevik menace. Never shall this, the most heinous crime, be forgiven, Soviet Russia. Readily would we overlook the repudiation of the Tsar's numerous obligations and even their refusal to pay their debts to the American and European moneylenders. We'd find some way to recuperate our losses at a reasonable profit, maybe. But that they have broken down the very pillars of capitalism, abolished profits, given to the peasants the master's lands for cultivation and use, proclaimed all wealth common property and subjected the aristocrat and capitalist to the indignity of working for a living, this hellish arch-crime they shall never be forgiven. That such things should threaten the rich of this free country is intolerable. Nothing must be left undone to prevent such a calamity. It would be terrible to be put on a level with the common laborer, and we, with all our millions, unable to procure champagne, because, forsooth, some hod carrier's brat, illegitimate perchance, did not get his milk for breakfast. Unthinkable. That is chaos, anarchy. We must not permit our beloved country to come to such a pass. Labor, rebellion, and discontent must be crushed, energetically, forthwith. Bolsheviki ways and Soviet ideas must gain no foothold in America. But the thing must be done diplomatically. The workers must not be permitted to look into our cards. We should be strong as a lion, subtle as the snake. The wartime anti-Hun propaganda is now directed against the Bolshevik, the radical, and particularly against the Slav or anything resembling him. The man or woman of Russian birth or nationality is made the especial target. The press, the pulpit, all the servile tools of capitalism and imperialism combined to paint Russia, Soviet Russia, in colors of blood and infamy. No misrepresentation, no lie too base to be flung at Russia. Falsehood and forgery, the weapons where guns and bayonets have failed. The direct result of this poison propaganda is now culminating in American pogroms against Russians, Bolsheviki, communists, radicals, and progressives in general. The United States has fortunately always been free from the vicious spirit of race hatred and persecution of the foreigner. The native Negro excepted, this country has known no race problem. The American people were never guilty of harboring bitterness or deep-seated prejudice against members of other nationalities. In truth, the great majority of them are themselves of foreign birth or descent, the only true native being the American Indian. Whatever racial differences there may exist between the various nationalities or stocks, they have never assumed the form of active strife. On the contrary, they have always been of a superficial nature, due to misunderstanding or other temporary causes, and have never manifested themselves in anything save light, good-humored banter. Even the much-advertised antagonism of the West toward the Chinese and Japanese is not due to any inherent hatred, but rather to very definite commercial and industrial factors. In the case of the Russians especially, as well as in regard to members of the various branches of the Slavic race, the people of America have always been particularly friendly and well disposed. But suddenly, all the wartime hatred toward the Hun enemy, the blindest intolerance and persecution, are poured upon the head of the Russian, the Slav. Great indeed is the power of propaganda. Great is the power of the American thought controller, the capitalist press. The Russian has become the victim of American pogroms. Often and again in the past have we anarchists pointed out that the feudal lords of this land would follow in their march to imperialism in the footsteps of the Tsars of old Russia, and even outdo their preceptors. Our liberal friends denounced us as fanatics, alarmists, and pessimists. Yet now we are confronted with the state of affairs in democratic America, which, in point of brutality and utter repudiation of every fundamental libertarian principle, 
surpasses the worst autocratic methods of the Tsars of Russia ever dared apply against political dissenters. The world is familiar with the story of the pogrom horrors practiced upon the Jews of Tsarist Russia. But what the world, especially the American world, does not know is that every pogrom in Russia was directly incited, financed, and prepared by the government as a means of distracting the attention of the Russian people from the corrupt despotic regime under which they suffered, a deliberate method of confusing and checking the fast-growing discontent and holding back the rising tide of revolutionary upheaval. But thoughtful people in Russia were not long deceived by this hellish stratagem. That is why Russians of character and intelligence never lend themselves to the practice of Jew-baiting and persecution. The authorities frequently had to resort to importing the human dregs of distant communities, fill them with vodka, and then turn them loose on the defenseless Jews. These black hundreds and hooligans of Tsarist Russia were the infamous regime now forever cast into the abyss of oblivion by the awakened and regenerated spirit of new Russia. There have been no pogroms in Soviet Russia. But the black hundreds and the hooligans have now come to life again in democratic America. Here they are more mad and pernicious than their Russian colleagues in crime had ever been. Their wild orgies of assault and destruction are directed, not against the Jew, but against the more comprehensive scapegoat of capitalism, the alien, the radical. These are being made the lightning rod upon which is to be drawn all the fury of the storm that is menacing the American plutocracy. As the Tsars pointed at the Jew as the sole source and cause of the Russian people's poverty and servitude, so the feudal lords of America have chosen the foreign radical, the Bolshevik, as the vicarious victim for the sins of the capitalist order. But while no intelligent and self-respecting Russian ever degraded himself with the Tsar's bloody work, we see in our democracy so-called cultured people, professional men and women, good Americans, inspired and aided by the respectable, reputable press, turn into bestial mobs. We see high government officials, state and federal, play the part of the hooligans, encouraging and aiding the American Black Hundred of legionaries in a frenzied crusade against the foreigner, whose sole crime consists in taking seriously the American guarantees of free speech, free press, and free assembly. The war hate against everything German was vicious enough, though the people of America were repeatedly assured that we were not making war against the German people. One can understand also, though not countenance, the vulgar clamor against the best and finest expressions of German culture, the stupid prohibition of the language of Goethe and Schiller, of the revolutionary music of Wagner and Beethoven, the poetry of Heine, the writings of Nietzsche, and all the other great creative works of Teuton genius. But what possible reason is there for the post-war hatred toward aliens in general, and Russians in particular? The outrages and cruelties perpetrated upon Germans in America during the war pale almost into insignificance compared with the horrible treatment the Russians in the United States are now subjected to. In fact, the Tsarist pogroms, bearing a few exceptions, never rivaled the fearful excesses now happening almost daily in various American cities, their victims, men and women, guilty only of being Russians. This state of affairs is the more significant because Russians and the Slavic people in general were hitherto always welcomed to these shores as the best offering Europe contributed to the Moloch of American industry. The Slav was so good-natured and docile, such a patient slave, so appreciative of the liberties he enjoyed in the new land, liberties which the socially conscious American had long since learned to see as a delusion and a snare, but to the unsophisticated Russian peasant, always half-starved and brow-beaten, they seemed real and resplendent, the symbol of paradise found, by the thousands he flocked to the promised land, swarmed into the centers of industry to build our railroads, forge iron, dig coal, till the soil, weave cloth, and toil at scores of other useful occupations, his reward a mere pittance. Nor was it only the workers in fields and factories who were welcomed here from Russia. Russian culture was an honored guest in America, the great literature of the Slav, his music, his dancing, all found the most generous reception and fullest appreciation. Above all the Russian intelligentsia, the political refugees, exiles, and active revolutionists that came to America, and came, most of them, not merely to express their opinions, but rather to plot the forcible overthrow of the Russian autocracy, 
all found sympathetic hearing and generous purses in this country, I even at the seat of government. And now? Now it is considered the most heinous crime to have been born in Russia. What has caused this peculiar change? What is the back of this sudden reversal of feeling? It is the Russian Revolution. Not, of course, the Miliuk of Kerensky Revolution, but the real revolution that gave birth to Soviet Russia. The submissive, enslaved, long-suffering Russian people unexpectedly transformed into a free, daring giant, breaking a new path for the progress of mankind. That is the reason for the changed attitude of the capitalistic world. It is one thing to help Russian revolutionists to overthrow the Tsar and to put in his place a democratic form of government, which has proven such a boon to our own Tsars of commerce and industry. But it is quite a different thing to see the Prometheus of labor rise in his might, strike off his chains and with the full consciousness of his complete economic power bring to life the dreams and aspirations of a thousand years the economic, political, and spiritual emancipation of the masses of the world. This pioneer social experiment, now being tried in Russia, the greatest and most fundamental ever witnessed in all history, is the guiding star to all the oppressed and disinherited of the world. Already its magic light is spreading over the whole European horizon, the harbinger of the approaching dawn of man. What if it should traverse the ocean and embrace our own shores within its orbit? The whole social order of the financial Tsars, industrial Kaisers, and land barons of America is at stake. The order, maintained by club and gun, by jail and lynch law, in and out of court. The order founded on robbery and violence, built upon sham and unreason, artificiality and insanity, and supported by misery and starvation by the water cure, the dungeon, and straitjacket. An order that transcends all chaos and daily makes confusion worse confounded. Such social order is doomed. It bears within itself the virus of disintegration. Already the conscience of America is awakening. The war marked the crisis. Already American men have chosen imprisonment, torture, and death, rather than become participants in an unholy war. Already American men and women are beginning to realize the antisocial destructive character and purpose of authority and government by violence, force, and fraud. Already the workers of America are outgrowing the vicious circle of craft unionism, learning the lesson and the power of solidarity of the international proletariat, and gaining confidence in their own initiative and judgment, to the confusion and terror of their antiquated spineless leadership. Already they are seeing through the sham of equality before the law, and are in open rebellion to government by injunction. A spark from the glowing flame of Soviet Russia, and the purse-proud autocracy of America may be swept away by the social conflagration. Wherefore the united chorus of old Tsars and Kaisers? Death to the Bolsheviki, the aliens, the IWWs, the communists, the anarchists. Whatever might be said of the American plutocracy and the government, no one can accuse them of originality. The methods used by them to confuse and confound the people are but cheap imitations of the old tactics long resorted to by the despotic rulers of Europe. Even before the World War, Washington had borrowed many a trick from London. And all through the war, American militarism, with its conscription, espionage, torture of conscientious objectors, and suppressive legislation was but aping, stupidly and destructively, the modus operandi of the bankrupt imperialism of the old world. For lack of originality and ideas, American officialdom was content to be the echo of the military and court circles of London and Paris. And now again, we witness Washington following in the exact footsteps of the worst autocracy of modern times. For the hue and cry against the alien is a faithful replica of the persecution of the Jews by the Tsars of Russia, and the American pogroms against radicals are the exaggerated picture of Russian Jew-baiting. And finally, the most infamous and most inhuman method of Tsarist Russia, the method that sacrificed hundreds of thousands of the finest and bravest men and women of Russia, and systematically robbed the country of the very flower of its youth, is now being transplanted on American soil, in these great United States the freest democracy on earth, the dreaded Russian administrative process, the newest American institutions, sudden seizure, anonymous denunciation, 
Star Chamber Proceedings, the Third Degree, Secret Deportation, and Banishment to Unknown Lands. O oh, shades of Jefferson, Thomas Paine, and Patrick Henry, that you must witness the bloodiest weapon of Tsarism, rescued from the ruins of defunct absolutism, and introduced into the country for whose freedom you had fought so heroically. What means the administrative process? It means the suppression and elimination of the political protestant and social rebel. It is the practice of picking men upon the street, on the merest suspicion of political untrustworthiness, of arresting them in their club rooms or homes, tearing them away from their families, locking them up in jails or detention pens, holding them incommunicado for weeks and months, depriving them of a hearing in open court, denying them trial by jury, and finally deporting them or banishing them to unknown shores. All this not for any crime committed or even any punishable act charged, but merely on the denunciation of an enemy or the irresponsible accusation by a secret service man that the suspect holds certain unpopular or forbidden opinions. Lest the truth or accuracy of this statement be called in question, let it be stated that at this very moment there are one hundred such political suspects held at Ellis Island, with several hundred more in the various immigration detention jails, every one of them a victim of the administrative process described above. Not one of them is charged with any specific crime. One and all are accused of entertaining illegal views on political or social questions. Nearly all of them have been seized on the street or arrested in their homes or reading rooms while engaged in the dangerous pursuit of studying the English language, mathematics, or American history. The latter seems lately to be regarded by the authorities as a particularly dangerous occupation, and those guilty of it a prima facie menace to our American institutions. Others were arrested in the factory, at their workbench, or in the numerous recent raids of homes and peaceful meetings. Many of them were beaten and clubbed most brutally, the wounds of some necessitating hospital treatment. In the police stations, they were subjected to the third degree, threatened, tortured, and finally thrust into the bull pens of Ellis Island. Here they are treated as dangerous felons, kept all the time under lock and key, and allowed to see their wives and families only once a week, with a screen between them and malicious guards constantly at their side. Here their mail is subjected to the most stringent censorship, and their letters delivered or not according to the whims of the petty officials in charge. Here some of them, because they dared protest against their isolation and the putrid food, were placed in the insane asylum. Here it was that the brutal treatment and unbearable conditions of existence drove men and women, the politicals awaiting deportation, to the desperate extremity of a hunger strike, the last resort of defenseless beings, the paradoxical self-defense of despair. For weeks and months, these men have now been kept prisoners at Ellis Island, tortured by the thought of their wives and children whom the government has ruthlessly deprived of support, and living in constant uncertainty of the fate that is awaiting them. For the good American government, refinedly cruel, is keeping their destination secret, and certain death may be the goal of the deportees when the hour of departure finally strikes. Such is the treatment and the fate of the first group of Russian refugees from American democracy. Such is the process known as the administrative methods, penalizing governmentally unapproved thought, suppressing disbelief in the omniscience of the powers that be, in enlightened, free America, not in darkest Russia. When the terrible significance of the administrative process practiced in Russia became known in Europe, civilization stood aghast. It caused a storm of protest in the British Parliament and called forth violent interpolations in the Italian Diet and the French Chamber. Even the German Reichstag, in the days of the omnipotent Kaiser, ventured a heated debate of the barbaric administrative process, which doomed thousands of innocents to underground dungeons and the frozen taigas of Siberia. Are the Tsar's methods, the third section, the secret political spy organizations, anonymous denunciations, star chamber proceedings, deprivation of trial, wholesale deportations and banishment to become an established American institution? Let the people speak. The full significance of the principle of deportation is becoming daily more apparent. The field of its menace is progressively broadening. Not only the alien social rebel is to be crushed by the new white terror, its hand is already reaching out far for the naturalized American, whose social views are frowned upon by the government, 
and yet deeper it strikes. One hundred percent Americanism is to root out the last vestige, the last memory of traditional American freedom. Not alone foreigners, but the naturalized citizen and the native-born are to be mentally fumigated, made politically reliable and governmentally kosher by eliminating the social critics and industrial protestants, by denaturalization and banishment, by exile to the island of Guam or the Alaska, the future Siberia of the United States. Following the alien radical, the naturalized American is the first victim of the tsarification of America. Patriotic profiteers and political hooligans are united in the cry for the Americanization of the foreigner in the United States. He is to be naturalized, intellectually sterilized and immunized to Bolshevism, so that he may properly appreciate the glorious spirit of American democracy. Simultaneously, however, the federal government is introducing the new policy of summarily depriving the naturalized American of his citizenship, in order to bring him, when so desired, within the scope of the administrative process which subjects the victim to deportation without trial. A most important precedent had already been set. The case of Emma Goldman affords significant proof to what lengths the government will go to rid itself of a disquieting social rebel, though he be a citizen for a quarter of a century. The story is interesting and enlightening. More than eight years ago, secret service men of the federal government were ordered to gather material in Rochester, New York, or elsewhere, that would enable the authorities to disfranchise a certain Rochester citizen. The man in question was of no concern whatever to Washington, as subsequent events proved. He was an ordinary citizen, a quiet working man, without any interest in social or political questions. He was never known to entertain any unpopular views or opinions. As a matter of fact, the man had long been considered dead by his local friends and acquaintances, since he had disappeared from his home years previously, and no clue to his whereabouts or any sign that he was still among the living could be found. Indeed, has not been found till this day, notwithstanding the best efforts. At great expense, and with considerable winking at its own rules and regulations in such matters, the United States government finally disfranchised the man, the corpse perhaps, for anything known to the contrary. The proceeding necessitated a good deal of secrecy and subterfuge, for even the wife of the man in question, whose status as citizen by right of her marriage was involved, was not apprised by the government of its intended action. On the pretext that the man was not fully of legal age at the time of his naturalization, about twenty years before, the mighty Republic of America declared the citizenship of the man of unknown whereabouts and against whom no crime or offense of any kind was ever charged as null and void. Ten years passed. The disfranchised citizen, so far as humanly known, was still as dead as at the time of his denaturalization. No trace of him could be found and nothing more was heard of the motives and purposes of the government in depriving of citizenship a man who had apparently been dead for years. Dark and peculiar are the ways of government. More time passed. Then it became known that the United States government intended to deport Emma Goldman. But Emma Goldman had acquired citizenship by marriage thirty years before, and as a citizen she could not be deported under the present laws of the United States. But lo and behold! The government suddenly announced that Emma Goldman was a citizen no more, because her husband had been disfranchised ten years ago. Dark and peculiar, indeed, are the ways of government. But there is method in its madness. What a striking comment this case affords on the true character of government, and the chicanery and subterfuge it resorts to when legal means fail to achieve its purposes. Long did the United States government bide its time. The moment was not propitious to get rid of Emma Goldman. But she must be gotten rid of, by fair means or foul. Yet public sentiment was not ready for such things as deportation and banishment. Patience. The hour of a great popular hysteria will come, will be made if necessary, and then we shall deport this bête noire of government. The moment has now come. It is here. The national hysteria against radicals, inspired and fed by the bourgeois press, pulpit, and politicians, has created the atmosphere needed to introduce in America the principle and practice of banishment. At last the government may deport Emma Goldman, for through the width and breadth of the country there is not a judge, and possibly not even a jury, with enough integrity and courage to give this enfant terrible a fair hearing and an unprejudiced examination of her claim to citizenship. 
Therefore, Emma Goldman is to be deported. But her case sets a precedent, and American life is ruled by legal precedents. Henceforth, the naturalized citizen may be disfranchised on one pretext or another, and deported because of his or her social views and opinions. Already Congress is preparing to embody this worthy precedent in our national legislation by passing special laws providing for the disenfranchisement of naturalized Americans for reasons satisfactory to our autocratic regime. Thus another link is forged to chain the great American people. For it is against the liberties and welfare of the people at large that these new methods are fundamentally directed. Not merely against Emma Goldman, the anarchists, the IWWs, communists, and other revolutionists. These are but the primary victims, the prologue which introduces and shadows forth the tragedy about to be enacted. The ultimate blow of the imperialist plutocracy of America is aimed at labor, at the increasing discontent of the masses, their growing class consciousness, and their progressive aspiration for more joy in life and beauty. The fate of America is in the balance. That is the true meaning and the real menace of the principle of deportation, banishment, and exile now being introduced in the life of the United States. That is the purpose of the state and federal anti-anarchist laws, criminal syndicalist legislation, and all similar weapons that the master class is forging for the defeat of the awakening proletariat of America. Shall the United States, once the land of opportunity, the refuge of all the oppressed, be Prussianized, tarified? Shall the melting pot of the world be turned into a fiery cauldron, brewing strife and slaughter, spitting tyranny and assassination? Shall we here, on this soil baptized with the sacred blood of the great heroes of the Revolutionary War, engage in the sanguinary struggle of brother against brother? Shall we reenact in this land the frightful nightmare of darkest Russia? Shall this land re-echo the horrible tramp? tramp of a thousand feet on their way to an American Siberia, tortured bodies, manacled hands, clanking chains, in weary, endless procession. Shall that be the heritage of our youth? Shall the songs of mothers be turned into a dirge, and little babies be suckled with the teat of hate? No, it shall not be. There is yet time to pause, to turn back. High time, high time for the voice of every true man and woman, of every lover of liberty, to thunder forth such a mighty collective protest that shall reverberate from north to south and east to west and rouse the awakened manhood of America to a heroic stand for liberty and justice. But if not, if our warning prediction unhappily come true and the fearful tragedy be played to its end, yet shall we not despair nor misdoubt the finale. Hateful is the dream of oppression, and as vain, where the man who could name the judges that doomed Socrates? Where the persecutors of the Gracchi, the banishers of Aristides, the excommunicators of Spinoza and Tolstoy? Their very memory is obliterated by the footsteps of progress. Unceasingly, it marches forward and upward, all obstacles notwithstanding, keeping time with the heartbeats of humanity. Vain the efforts to halt it, to banish ideas, to strangle thought, Vain the frenzied struggle to turn back the hands of time. The mightiest Goliath of reaction has fought his last fight, his final gesture. Old Russia, a hopeless surrender. Too late to revive this corpse. It is beyond resurrection. Attempts there may be, aye, will be, for the Bourbons never learn. And the people are long-suffering, but attempts useless, destructive, utterly fatal to their purpose. The dream of reaction ends in abysmal nightmare. It is darkest before dawn, in history as in nature, but the dawn has begun in Russia. Its light is a promise and the hope of the world. End of section 1